Today I wanted to do a lesson on a few essential endgames, something we haven't done in a very long time. Um, in the previous episodes, we have looked at some must-know rook endgames, some knight endgames, some fortresses. Um, so this time I picked um, three more essential endgames, <laughs> or well, four, uh, kind of. It's one. It's two and one. And these endgames are quite common, and they're very useful to know. Okay. Let's start with something simple. This one is rook against bishop and equal pawns. And this is a game by Gary Kasparov playing as black. Just, just to know, but we're not going to look... We're mainly going to see the main ideas, and I will be asking you, what do you think about this position initially? Do you think these positions are winning or drawn? Well, there is probably... If you, if you know about it and if you learn about it, you probably know, but I do not know. So... I could think that black should win this. I don't think there is a fortress enough for white because um, the black king, exactly kitten, the black king will just move forward and the rook will have enough movement to either give checks or to like, uh, yeah, occupy all the pieces. That's my simple yeah, idea. That's that's a really good guess. So. Um, I agree that black should win this type of endgame. It's also no risk at all for black, so they can just shuffle around for as long as they want. <laughs> uh, but um, this is pretty... I, I, I don't want to say easily, but um, it's it's uh, it's very possible to find uh, quite a few wins here for black. So uh, you're right about that evaluation. If it's just rook versus bishop, then that's tough. But because we have these two pawns, black has some targets there. So initially, you're right. The plan, we need to bring out the king. And um, here, where did you want to bring the king? What was your idea here? Yeah, that's an interesting thought. But maybe to e2 or f3 and then attack the f2 pawn if it's still there. Something like that. But yeah, it is difficult close. because of the bishop, of course. Yeah, you're very close. So either e2 or e1. You know, uh -huh. I like whenever the bishop is on uh, um, is on a light square. I like to just only put your pieces on the light squares, just because yeah. why not? It's um, you mean you mean dark squares, yeah? Yes, all of the dark squares, so that there's no checks or anything. Mm -hmm. So, um, because this is a light squared bishop, we can target this exact pawn. So that's the whole plan of this end game: is that we want to target this pawn and bring the king to e1. Now, we can't do it immediately because this pawn is also hanging. And remember that in such endgames, or in general, we don't want to make too many rushed pawn movements. So we could play a 5 and f6 and probably be okay. But if we can just not touch the pawn structure, that's usually a good principle in such endgames. Um, unless the pawn is standing badly or anything. But otherwise, we don't really rush with any pawn breaks or any pawn moves. So then the rook comes there so that the king can be free. And as we can see, Gary Kasparov goes for that exact plan with just bringing the king. He shuffles around a little bit more with the rook. Whenever it needs to defend, it goes back. But at the end of this whole journey, the rook, uh, the king does come to e1. And the reason why the king on e1 is good is that it is going to threaten rook c2 at some point. Not yet, but at some point, rook c2 would have won that pawn. So because of that, because this is... Um, at some point threatened with, uh, let's say, f6, rook b7, and rook b2, um, white decides to go for f4. So <laughs> just to change the pawn structure Tricky. a little bit. Tricky. Now which, we cannot get f2 anymore. Aww. Yeah, which is already progress um, because we have changed white's pawn structure. So what do you think the second part of the plan is here for black? Now we tackle g3. Yes, that's also good. Oh, uh, okay. Right now we can't really put like our king on f2 if sure. we could. That would be great. But um, there isn't really a way to target g3 with both our king and our rook yet. So we're actually going to go for a pawn break. What, which one do you think oh, it might be? Oh, well, look, this I wouldn't uh, have thought of. I, I see, because of course, yeah, and it makes sense, because for now the rook is protecting f7. Well, pawn break, I mean, I would go from f7 to f6 and then to g5. Exactly, that's okay. the pawn break. This one might be a little bit harder to find, um, just intuitively, because you don't want to trade pawns in such endgames. If all of the pawns are gone, then you increase white's drawing chances. But 
Um, you're right about that. So F6 and um, G5 is going to be the next part of the plan. Hmm. So first we improve the king to where it's going to stand a little bit better. And then we go for G5 plan. Once again, after preparing it and going here. So if you... Um, if you look at this, basically you don't want the pawns to be symmetrical, but you do want to take back with the rook. And here, white oh. even resigned already. Maybe it was the Kerry Kasparov effect that he was playing <laughs> and he knew he was going to lose. But um, this is now a winning position. So the reason you take with the rook, you don't really want the pawns to be symmetrical. And the rook is really nice here because it's threatening f5 f4 I see. and the king cannot really do anything about it because this pawn is on the dark square it's now going to be a weakness forever and black is going to win it if the king ever goes away then the king is going to join and um and that that's all it's going to win that pawn how oh, cool and okay. uh, yeah the pawn cannot really advance so uh not really much left to do once black wins this pawn then uh, then it's then it's pretty much game over. So it's mm -hmm. this one is not like it's not a very easy like um, end game to just know right off the bat. But a lot of these things like are intuitive, and if you ever get anything similar, then it's good to know that rook versus bishop and three pawns is you know favorable and pretty much winning for black uh, for the side with the rook. Um, in these end games, I find that the most important part is not even maybe knowing how to win them, but sometimes it's just knowing whether it's winning or losing just so that you know whether you should go for that end game whether like if a trade is offered you if, if you want to go for this one or not that to me is even a more useful part than knowing like the precise moves of how to uh how to finish it off i have to mention something because from what you just said it's uh very very understandable and clear now i would go to the next uh, thing and the next thing and then leave it at that and I think I might even remember it. But to be absolutely clear about this, if you have Fritz 19, um, I would suggest to take the position, which is in our article in the Chessbase news site, and replay it against the computer and try to win it as black. Because that's where, if you do this one, two, three times, I'm certain you'll have it in your blood and easily can manage because there will always be some different moves. I mean, you can even play against the different characters on a higher level so they don't make too many mistakes. And yeah, really, that's a good training. I did the same uh, in December and it worked quite well. Yeah, and you can play against the turtle, which is an endgame expert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want a challenge. For example, yeah. Okay, so here is the next one. I think the queen versus rook endgame is a bit oh. underrated. Um, not many people really learn it. Um, do you think you would be confident in winning this as the side with the king and the queen? Ooh, I would say yes. I think I could manage. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have always thought, in my head, I always thought that they were, you know, they were okay. I would just find some checks and eventually win the rook. Yeah, but I know... That's, that's, that's how I think most people uh, who haven't studied this endgame particularly, they just think, okay, I know that with the queen is winning. Um, if black has no pawns, if black has a pawn, then it's there's some like drawing fortresses. But um, otherwise, you just find some checks, win the rook, and that's it. But um, it's difficult. That's why I'm doing this lesson is because we get we'll get to learn about some general strategies as white and as black. Did you um did you have any uh, when if you would ever get this position either as the defending side or as the side with the queen? Any strategies that you would use? Uh, so for white, well, it has to happen uh, on some way that we have to push the king on the last row, I assume. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there has to be at one point, if I remember correctly, it's Zugzwang. So at there is at one point, uh, if I say at one point, one more time, I'm going to go crazy. But uh, <laughs> if the rook, uh, it has to stay on one of the files or, or rows. And with a clever check, you can probably win the rook and then the game. Mm -hmm. I That's don't think good. you can. I'm not sure if you can checkmate. I mean, you can probably, but I guess it's about winning the rook. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Usually, it's about winning the rook. And so, for black, it is. Yeah. 
I wouldn't know, to be honest. Uh, what would be the best tactic? Maybe stay in the middle as long as possible and always keep the rook connected to the king if... Yeah. Yes, you're exactly. You're on a good oh, track. Okay. So as white, as the side with the queen, um, we, of course, try to push the king to, the, to any edge. It doesn't matter which edge. You try to do it as quickly as possible. Um, because you want to avoid the 50 move rule. That's usually how black makes a draw here is by this 50 move rule. So um, you, and you also need to be careful about some stalemate tricks. So we're going to see Aye, yeah. how this game ends, which is why I thought it was interesting. It's a game between Morozevich and Yakovenko. It's, oh. and um, it featured a really good defense as the defending side, which I think is honestly harder to like put up a good defense here of rather course. than uh, win here. So, uh, and as black, as the side with the rook, you want to keep the rook in a safe zone as much as you can. So right next to the king, where it cannot be forked. And you try to make white's advance difficult. So staying in the center, if you can, is good. And um, just trying to keep track of the 50 moves and uh, making sure <laughs> you don't lose the rook to any silly check. So um, let's see this game, through which I'll explain some of these general guidelines and we will see how it's also ended very instructively so cutting um, off the king that seems correct yes, for now that's good well the exact moves like i'm not really focused on the exact moves in these end games as you can see just yeah. because a lot of them are equivalent or so we're more focused on the ideas kind of absolutely so the, yeah. rook, the rook is staying a little bit like closer and the thing is if you're going to go away with the rook you just kind of need to check that there's no um that you're not getting caught into any into any fork and then it's and then it's all good so here white's um black's rook is pretty safe here's another tactic if the rook has to go away you can use the king as a shield. as like a shield because yeah. that means that the queen cannot really give any sideways checks and win this rook so it's it's a funny tactic that uh, he has used a few times um in the game where if the rook goes there as a shield then it's all good um, and as the attacking side, usually the checks with the queen are not that productive. Of course, you can mm -hmm. give checks like at the, like it's it's obviously all good and doesn't ruin anything. But if you just keep making checks all the time, that doesn't really make progress for the king to cut it off. So you more you need to do more so like these knight confirmations kind of. It's the same way that we checkmate with the queen, right? Yeah. Um, so these L confirmations that usually are a bit more restrictive than any checks that you might give so either way um they played on for a bit i i did get worried about his rook for a few times but i'm sure that he you know he made sure that there was no check um and basically the good thing about um his defense is that this rook is really helpful on just any file that cuts off the opponent's king from advancing. So that's another strategy as a defense. Mm -hmm. As long as you don't lose the rook to any forks, try to keep it on this, Whoa. whatever it is, the fourth rank in this case, just to prevent the king from advancing as long as possible. So maybe here White was already starting to worry about the 50 move rule, but he did make some progress. So he almost made it. The rook is always staying on this file to prevent the, the advance. Now he uses this... Uh, the shield Bam. tactic. Shield tactic again, uh, just because he had to go somewhere else. Uh, and finally, white got on the right track. This is like a good confirmation. And um, he finally put the king to the back rank. Mm -hmm. So um, after many moves... How many was this, if you just for curiosity... How many moves were this from when we started? Like around like 20 or 30 or... 32. Ooh, so 18 left. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's been 32. So it's uh, that's what I'm saying. It might become worrisome. Hmm. And But basically, white is already really close. Um, mm -hmm. White is already really close. At least the king is on the last rank. And um, after a couple more checks, almost every queen versus rook endgame ends up in something like this. Or at least something <laughs> okay. similar. Um, so usually the king on b7, king here. And this is really, this is probably like the important position to know here. Um, there's a few more that we have, we have looked at one of them in the, in the previous episodes, I think. It was the, I think it's called the Philidor position. It was white king, I'll just tell you to imagine it, white king on f3, then white queen on h4, 
black king on g1 and black rook on g2. That one is also a classic position. Mm -hmm. So it might be useful to know these, especially as the winning side, just mm -hmm. so that you once you get there, you know that it's winning and you just give, you know which checks to give. So these ones are um, are good to know, but this one as well, um, because finding this under, under time pressure is really not easy. Um, what would you play here um, as white, do you think? Well, if you're asking me like this again, it's probably not queen g3. And I assume it is because of stalemate. Queen g3 is totally fine, oh. but you have a right feeling about it. There are some stalemate ideas there. All right. So maybe queen e4 would be um, a bit better. Yes, actually, it is a bit better, in my opinion. There is loads of options. Okay. Queen e4 is one of them. Um, queen e5 is another one. Um, there is one interesting method that I like about this position. You can kind of pass the move to black by just playing a waiting move like queen there. Um, and then and then basically you, all, what you want is get back oh, to this position funny, and pass the move, black's move yeah. to, to black so that their rook has to go away and then that's, that's already better. You're probably, I mean, no matter where the rook goes, there's some good checks to give and you most likely win it so mm. this position with blocked move is winning so that, that's like a funny way to give just give the move back but queen g3 you had the right um you had the right idea here that there might be stalemate um there's yeah so basically any simple way to win this is just to make sure that the rook goes away and look if we get to this position the one that i mentioned with um kind of the king and the rook yeah. there very close to the one that i said about about this confirmation, this one should be winning. But anyways, the reason why this game was interesting to me is because um, these are very strong grandmasters who are playing it. And you can try to guess what white played to get into a stalemate trap. Oh, I assume it's king f3. Exactly. Do you yeah. see how, how it, black stalemates after that? Um, I think it is... Uh, it's just rook f2 check right yes and you keep yeah. giving these checks so it's a very like it's a very tough uh, like um it's it's it feels i'm sure that this feels really bad because you made it so <laughs> yes. far you got them to the to the corner and then there's just this and then the rook keeps chasing the king no matter where it goes and it can never be captured because this king and queen are in a stalemate so this i think is an important like idea to know whether you're on the side with the queen or on the side with the rook very good um, indeed yeah and uh, this happens in a real game between a real grandmaster so it can happen to anybody so it's always worth it to to be careful Brutal. about these ones so maybe that i hope that makes the rook versus queen um a bit more clear of how Bearable. to play in it but of course <laughs> you'll never know until you try it so that's why i think it's a good idea um what arne suggested trying to play it um with with Fritz is good. Trying to play it with somebody you know is good, just as like practice and just to see if you can do it as as the side with the queen or as the side with the yeah. rook, whether you can make it. So um, let's go to the last one, two examples, and start with this one. So hmm. another important topic in any games I find is the bishop versus knight, and there are many possibilities of how it can happen, but uh, there are still some good guidelines to know. So what do you think is an indication of whether a bishop or a knight is stronger? Well, in general, if the bishop has a lot of space, then the bishop is just stronger. While in a closed game or where there's uh, um, little space left, then the knight has an advantage. So here I would, and since it's an end game and there's lot, all the pieces are gone already, I assume the bishop part has an advantage but i wouldn't know how this game i i would say it would be a draw but who am i to say something like that no you're you're exactly right about uh, about your evaluation um basically um the position seems equal and it's it's slightly better for black but black has very good chances so mm -hmm. um since the position is open you're right that the bishop is stronger than the knight um, and um, an indicate another indicator of 
um, another important indicator is not even just the open position, but it's whether the pawns are on both sides of the board. So oh. here there's both the king side and the queen side, and that favors the bishop. If these two pawns were gone, then it favors the knight. I mean, it's a pretty easy draw, but if these pawns are gone, but then it favors the knight if the pawns are on one side of the board. What? That is interesting. That I didn't know. Hmm. Usually, especially if there's more pawns. So, for example, if these two pawns are standing like here and here, um, the more pawns there are, the more it favors the knight, just I because see. more targets to attack. Um, but they're pretty like uh, they're pretty easy to draw. Although I've won, uh, I've won an end game like that with four pawns versus um, four pawns and knight versus bishop. So it really depends on like very few deep some details mm -hmm. so um that's one guideline to know about the whether they're on two sides or on one side of the board and um uh yeah of course so we can try to look at just the rest of, of this position once again the move the moves don't really matter it's more about the plants another important thing is whose kink gets to the center first because you know if white's king got somewhere to be seven first then that would favor white but um that's another thing that can be used to evaluate the end games is which king is more active. Usually king is like a very, very important piece. Some people yeah. even equate it to the rook's value in an end game. Ooh. So um so yeah, here basically black's king gets to stand in the center first, which is another indicator that what black should be the one uh playing for the win. And uh what do you think is the plan that the side with the bishop should aim for next? I don't know. I okay, let me think. I, I really wouldn't know to be honest. So um getting the pawn on B3 doesn't just simply doesn't seem to be possible for now. Well so... yes, but it's it's something that we can if we're allowed, then our king might can go there. So okay. Um, basically the plan is to infiltrate with the king, doesn't matter which side, whichever yeah, side, okay. whichever side you're allowed to. And one way to do that is to get the king away from the d3 square. So, um, one of these ways is to play bishop c8 and bishop to a6. And then depending on where the king goes, then you decide whether you want to go oh, funny. on one side or on the other side. Something that we do in pawn end games a lot too. So, For example, if they go on this side... Yeah. And then we manage to win this b3 pawn. Even if they get a different pawn for it, um, the outside pass pawn is usually decisive in such cases. Mm. In these bishop versus knights, the knight is just not fast enough to, um, or powerful enough to ever stop like an outside pass pawn. It will probably have to give itself up for it. And um, in case white goes to this side, which is what happens in the example, um, then we can eventually have an entry square to e4 and start to attack the pawns on this side of the board. Um, of course, white could have controlled things better as well, but, um, but still. So the knight goes away, just tries to attack some pawns, and then it goes to f8. And here, there's only one, two winning ideas. Basically, it's just the same one idea. What do you think is the way to, to do this for black? Maybe defend the g6 pawn with the bishop somehow and then get the king over to g2. Oh, wait, how? That's not even possible. What am I talking about? Yeah, right about? now it's, it would be a long road. <laughs> but, yeah. Well, in this case, we... Uh, oh, wait a you second. You notice this knight here. Yes, now I see it. That is, of course, unfortunate, but that knight is gone. Basically, yes. So the king goes to f6, right? And then... Um, not not really, not f6, because the knight ah, has, an it has square a check like on h7. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Let me double check. You can't stop it from going to h7. Oh, but you can't. Okay. You can just make a useful move okay, to remove okay. that defense. Well... Wow, why am I struggling so hard here? Um, well, is it just G5? It is just G5. Oh. 
it doesn't outright win the knight, right? But we're taking away that square. So yes, of course, the knight can still go there. Yeah, but then but, we win uh, a pawn. But that doesn't really save the knight. We're just going to take. And then the knight still has no squares. Yeah. So g5 is one of those few winning moves that exist in that position. Hmm. So I hope people at home were also able to find it. And um, after, if white ever takes, then look at this knight. It has no squares. And then you just play bishop f5 and win that knight. So that's another thing to know for these bishop versus knight endgames. If the knight is ever on the rim, there's always a way to control it with the bishop. The bishop can just control the knight fully from yeah. these certain squares. So it's that's good to keep brutal. an eye on that to try to win that knight at some point. Um, in the real example, it just went on uh, like this because white defended it. Uh, but still, that wasn't enough to defend the pawn forever. And uh, as we have said, the outside passer is always, pretty much always decisive in these games for the side with the bishop. So the game just ended with the outside pass pawn and white's pass pawn was not fast enough. Although it was close, but it was not fast enough here. So I have one more kind of a variation of this end game mm -hmm. and then we'll uh, that will be it for today. The one that I wanted to show is kind of the opposite of it is where the position is closed, huh. as we've mentioned. And <laughs> the thing here... We can consider that this is on both sides of the board, but it's kind of the pawns are just everywhere. So there's just more pawns yes. in this one to keep the positions close. And of course, um, the knight in such cases is better because the bishop just doesn't really have many good diagonals and it has to defend all of his pawns that are on the same on the same color as him. Mm -hmm. What do you think white should do in this case then? Well, there must be some perfect spot for the knight and also the king can go to f2 e3 d4 c5 and then decide which direction to take depending on exactly. where the black king is going to exactly so the first thing we need to activate the king because the knight can activate itself at any point yeah. um the king activity in the end games is super super important it's something i forget a lot in my games too uh, because you focus on your other pieces and then the king just kind of stays behind so that's something that has to be done like as quickly as possible is to get to them to the perfect squares. And I like that you right away identified which is the perfect square for it, and it is c5. And uh, the same thing we can do with the knight. The knight has a lot of good squares. d4 is good. b4 is good. So you just decided based on which pawn you want to attack. And um, what should the next phase be for, for white then? Now I think it is... Um possible to get black into some Zugzwang once again. There must be somewhere. I remember that Carsten Müller was uh, talking about quite some similar situation, but maybe it is a different matter. So how about we get our knight active now because the king can stay there and maybe yeah. we can get the knight, try to get the knight to, oh, I wouldn't know how to get it to d6. Well, it is possible if we so we go to g5 and then to f7 and then to d6. Yeah, so that it's should help. Possible to bring the knight to d6 if that's allowed. Probably a really good square. Mm -hmm. Um, basically, the plan that the principle that we should go for it's the principle of two weaknesses. You've heard of it before, right? Yeah. We always in end games. That's that's usually um, a good principle for these like slow end games where one side is kind of trying to improve the position. And one weakness usually is not enough. So here we could say that black has a weakness on e6, and it's definitely a big weakness. But if our knight stands here forever and his bishop stands there forever, we're not going to get anywhere because it's easy to defend when it's just one weakness. But if we create a second one, that really changes things. And that's usually how these endgames are won. And you can probably see any um, top grandmaster that wins uh, ends up winning an endgame it's because of that principle, because they keep creating a second weakness there. Um, so what white needs to do is to target these pawns. I know you mentioned the knight to d6. Oh. Um, I don't know if it would ever be possible, because white, black might play h6. Yeah, true. But basically, we, we want to try to attack these two pawns and make them advance. So the knight goes 
uh, there to try to play knight h5, which would be a threat. So they defend against it. And then we try, we also indirectly made that pawn advance just because knight g5 was a threat. So black didn't really do anything wrong. They just advanced the pawns forward. But already these advanced pawns can be weaknesses because they're on the, on the dark squares and the knight can just keep attacking them. So now... Basically, white provoked every single pawn to be on the on the light square. Um, and uh, we get to this position, and you see that now there's two weaknesses. This one and this one, which changes things for, um, for the side with the mm -hmm. knight here. Um, and now we do exactly what you said. We need a zugzwang. Where, okay. would, it, where would we need to for it to be a zugzwang? Where would we, where would we need to get... I would say our knight has to go to g7 somehow, and then the bishop cannot move anymore. So the king the has. The only question is how does the knight get to g7? That is the question. So how do we get him there? One, There's two, a different three, square that four, does the same five. job. Does it? Oh, yeah, it's so easy. Uh, F4, why do I have to be so complicated? Okay, F4, <laughs> F4 should is the be much easier square yeah, reachable in three, four moves, maybe. Yeah. So we can't go there right away, knight g2, but we do get there eventually. So just trying to get to f4. And hmm. once the knight gets there, this is kind of a zugzwang. Um, so right now, everything is defended. Bishop defends both of them. Mm -hmm. King defends both of, the, both of these squares. So one final move. How do we do the zugzwang? We move a pawn, I guess, before. Yeah, pawn before. I think that's the most mm -hmm. clear way to do it. And that's how, that's basically the end of it. That's usually how a knight can dominate against the bishop is by creating two weaknesses and then putting the bishop into the zugzwang because the bishop cannot defend both things at the same time if it's put into that situation. Here, the king was also part of that zugzwang, so the king had to move away and then uh, White ended up winning the rest of the pawns and winning this endgame. So those are just two opposing examples of how a knight can be stronger, how a bishop can be stronger, depending on the pawn structure um, and the king activity. So uh, that was it for uh, for my examples today. I hope you learned something new about endgames. Massively. To be honest, um, I'm, I'm not sure. I... I... I have the feeling I really learned a lot today. Um, yeah, especially because most of this I knew a little, but that's just not enough. But now I have the now feeling I'm quite prepared. Yeah. So uh, to be honest, um, I hope we can do a couple of more of these in the future. What about you at home? Did you feel the same? Or do you want to have, as always, like some here, some there, something like this? Or would you also appreciate some more of those must know endgame examples. Uh, write it in the comments if you feel like, and thank you for watching. Thank you, Svetlana, and we see each other soon enough.